Welcome to Academic Game Tutorials. In this video we will discuss in details about Greg Mankiw's 10 Principles of Economics. This video is a part of our course on Engineering Economics. We will cover all related topics one by one. Before starting, if you haven't subscribed to this channel yet, just click on subscribe and press the bell icon. Here, we come up with new videos on different subjects to make the academic studies easier for you. So, into the topic. Economics is the study of how society manages its scarce resources. In most societies, resources are allocated not by a single central planner but through the combined actions of millions of households and firms. Economists therefore study how people make decisions, how much they work, what they buy, how much they save, and how they invest their savings. Economists also study how people interact with one another. Gregory Mankiw, in his Principles of Economics, outlines 10 principles of economics that are as follows. Principle number 1. People face trade-offs. The first lesson about making decisions is summarized in the adage, there is no such thing as a free lunch. To get one thing that we like, we usually have to give up another thing that we like. Making decisions requires trading off one goal against another. Acknowledging life's trade-offs is important because people are likely to make good decisions only if they understand the options that they have available. Principle number 2. The cost of something is what you give up to get it. Because people face trade-offs, making decisions requires comparing the costs and benefits of alternative courses of action. In many cases, however, the cost of some action is not as obvious as it might first appear. The opportunity cost of an item is what you give up to get that item. When making any decision, such as whether to attend college, decision makers should be aware of the opportunity costs that accompany each possible action. In fact, they usually are. College-age athletes who can earn millions if they drop out of school and play professional sports are well aware that their opportunity cost of college is very high. It is not surprising that they often decide that the benefit is not worth the cost. Principle number 3. Rational people think at the margin. Decisions in life are rarely black and white but usually involve shades of grey. When it's time for dinner, the decision you face is not between fasting or eating meat, but whether to take that extra spoonful of mashed potatoes. When exams roll around, your decision is not between blowing them off or studying 24 hours a day, but whether to spend an extra hour reviewing your notes instead of watching TV. Economists use the term marginal changes to describe small incremental adjustments to an existing plan of action. Keep in mind that margin means edge, so marginal changes are adjustments around the edges of what you are doing. A rational decision maker takes an action if and only if the marginal benefit of the action exceeds the marginal cost. Principle number 4. People respond to incentives. Because people make decisions by comparing costs and benefits. Their behavior may change when the costs or benefits change. That is, people respond to incentives. When the price of an apple rises, for instance, people decide to eat more pears and fewer apples, because the cost of buying an apple is higher. At the same time, apple orchards decide to hire more workers and harvest more apples, because the benefit of selling an apple is also higher. When analyzing any policy, we must consider not only the direct effects but also the indirect effects that work through incentives. If the policy changes incentives, it will cause people to alter their behavior. Principle number 5. Trade can make everyone better off. Consider how trade affects your family. When a member of your family looks for a job, he or she competes against members of other families who are looking for jobs. Families also compete against one another when they go shopping because each family wants to buy the best goods at the lowest prices. So, in a sense, each family in the economy is competing with all other families. Countries as well as families benefit from the ability to trade with one another. Trade allows countries to specialize in what they do best and to enjoy a greater variety of goods and services. Principle number 6. Markets are usually a good way to organize economic activity. Today, most countries that once had centrally planned economies have abandoned this system and are trying to develop market economies. In a market economy, 
the decisions of a central planner are replaced by the decisions of millions of firms and households. Firms decide whom to hire and what to make. Households decide which firms to work for and what to buy with their incomes. These firms and households interact in the marketplace, where prices and self-interest guide their decisions. Yet, despite decentralized decision-making and self-interested decision-makers, market economies have proven remarkably successful in organizing economic activity in a way that promotes overall economic well-being. Principle number 7. Governments can sometimes improve market outcomes. Although markets are usually a good way to organize economic activity, this rule has some important exceptions. There are two broad reasons for a government to intervene in the economy, to promote efficiency and to promote equity. That is, most policies aim either to enlarge the economic pie or to change how the pie is divided. Principle number 8. A country's standard of living depends on its ability to produce goods and services. The differences in living standards around the world are staggering. In 1997 the average American had an income of about $29,000. In the same year, the average Mexican earned $8,000, and the average Nigerian earned $900. Not surprisingly, this large variation in average income is reflected in various measures of the quality of life. Citizens of high-income countries have more TV sets, more cars, better nutrition, better health care, and longer life expectancy than citizens of low-income countries. Because lower investment today means lower productivity in the future, government budget deficits are generally thought to depress growth in living standards. Principle number 9. Prices rise when the government prints too much money. In Germany in January 1921, a daily newspaper cost 0.30 marks. Less than two years later, in November 1922, the same newspaper cost 70 million marks. All other prices in the economy rose by similar amounts. This episode is one of history's most spectacular examples of inflation, an increase in the overall level of prices in the economy. What causes inflation? In almost all cases of large or persistent inflation, the culprit turns out to be the same, growth in the quantity of money. When a government creates large quantities of the nation's money, the value of the money falls. And finally, Principle number 10. Society faces a short-run trade-off between inflation and unemployment. If inflation is so easy to explain, why do policymakers sometimes have trouble ridding the economy of it? One reason is that reducing inflation is often thought to cause a temporary rise in unemployment. The curve that illustrates this trade-off between inflation and unemployment is called the Phillips curve, after the economist who first examined this relationship. The trade-off between inflation and unemployment is only temporary, but it can last for several years. So, we have learned in details, about about Greg Mankiw's 10 Principles of Economics. Thank you.